Back in 2018, I went to a really strange show made up of virtual reality, augmented reality, live electronic music, theatre and cinematic projections. It was called Whilst the Rest Was Sleeping. This is the story of something very strange that happened in 1959 in America. What happened was so strange, in fact, that none of the people directly affected by the story have been able to tell it for over 50 years. It is a story which has become almost entirely lost. Yeah, it's sort of a, it's a story that got out of hand. For anybody not familiar with it, could you explain to me what Whilst the Rest Was Sleeping was? So it ended up being uh, a very large scale show with 17 VR installations, virtual reality, uh, augmented reality, uh, feature length documentary film. Um, it had live performers, it had uh, 15 live performers, um, theatre performers, and a whole lot else of size. But right back at the beginning, back in 2014, it was just a one small virtual reality installation uh, that I made with some friends, almost for a joke, really. And what happened was, as soon as we started playing it out and touring it around, audiences seemed to be really enchanted by the story. And so I ended up building it bigger um, as, I, as I toured it. The atmosphere from the, from the off was very eerie. Really scary. And even doing something virtually, it feels spooky. And, and, and also, I suppose, because I know it's... It is a true story. It, it was it was so weird. One of the strangest things I've ever done. It was proper immersive. You want to know more and you want an answer. That was insane. I know, it's kind of scared to know more, but also intrigued as well. It kind of made me feel more like I was part of the story. Like, it's quite dreamlike. I, I did, I felt immersed in it. I want to know more about the story, but I want to tell other people the story. Yeah, and I want to go research this now because it's so... Strange. You're going to want to know more. Can we talk about the story itself? Yeah, it was a story I first heard about when I was 13, uh, when my grandfather bought me this magazine called Mysteries of the World, um, which is one of those magazines that was full of kind of spooky, scary stories. And I used to lie under the covers at night uh, with a torch and read it and I was trying to freak myself out before I went to sleep so that I would have uh, interesting dreams and in it was this story about how in 1959 um, eight college kids and their teacher one morning went on a school trip and they didn't return at the end of the day. The search for their whereabouts continued for a number of months. The local reservoir and stretches of the Snake River were dredged but nothing and no one was ever found. The case was eventually dropped, and with no rational explanation for what had happened to them, the people involved quietly allowed the story to be forgotten, like a bad dream that had no place in the real world. Now, this was, all took place in Idaho. Uh, they were from a place called Albion, and the school bus was discovered 10 miles into the Great Basin Desert, all burnt out and on its side in a ditch. And what was discovered about um, an hour's walk from there was this shack um, black kind of cube shaped shack and inside was a table with eight letters laid out and those letters were farewell letters from the kids who disappeared and everything I just told you um, is made up but what happened was that as I was touring the show uh, and I was being interviewed on the radio on TV in magazines and so on I started talking about the show as if it was real. Why did you choose that story and how does it work into such a modern uh, storytelling culture? This is a story that I first heard about when I was 13. My grandfather bought me a, a magazine called Mysteries of the World. Based on quite a remarkable and rather chilling story. Uh, Simon, good morning to you. It's, it's a heck of a story. Uh, what is it? So when I was 13 years old, my grandfather gave me a magazine which was called Mysteries of the World. It was a story I heard about when I was 13. I read it in a, in a magazine called Mysteries of the World that my grandfather gave me. Joining me on Skype from London, England is artist Simon Wilkinson and uh, he's going to tell us a little bit about what's happened to these eight high school students and a teacher who disappeared in 1959 in Idaho. He tells the story of a disappearance that happened in 1959 in America. Eight college kids 
went missing. They were missing for two weeks and everybody was looking for them. After two weeks, um, what was discovered were eight letters written by the students. And that sort of certain, certain suddenly became an idea because at the time there was all these rumblings about post-truth, um, about um, living in a world through social networking where conspiracy theories had run wild. And I thought it was suddenly interesting to use this show as a, as a means to um, expand uh, a conversation around that topic. And in particular, I, I, I read about this thing called the Mohawk Valley Formula from 1937, which was a uh, public relations formula or a propaganda formula for convincing people that things were real, uh, that, that uh, fake things were real. It was devised to break a strike uh, in Mohawk Valley in New York State. Um, and so as I toured and as I did these lectures and as I did these interviews, the story kind of took on its own life uh, naturally grew as I had to answer questions which I hadn't thought of and sort of spiraled out of control. What happened was so strange, in fact, that none of the people directly affected by the story have been able to tell it for over 50 years. Whilst the rest were sleeping beneath a circle of black sky, I killed him. What it made me realize was that at the time, you know, since 2010, I'd been working with virtual reality as if it was a new technology. And in terms of headsets, it was a new technology. But in terms of the idea of creating a virtual world, it wasn't a new idea. That idea came from marketing and propaganda, from things like the Creel Committee in the First World War and uh, the Mohawk Valley Formula, Engineer of Consent, the essay from um, Edward Bernays that actually creating fake realities is really actually uh, over 100 years old, let's say. So a few things to say about virtual reality. Number one, it's not new. The technology is new. But the idea of making a different reality for people is not new. The art of public relations and marketing is the art of altering those reality tunnels. And I was thinking it would be kind of fun to do that as an art piece. Rather than just make something where people come, they sit for an hour and a half, and then they go away and it's all forgotten, how about doing something that's more like a PR campaign that goes over a pr protracted period of time? How do we deal with the ethics of fictionalizing the world? Is there a problem or not? Well, the world is fictionalized. Well, actually, what shocked me in the first instance was how many of them didn't question it at all. And some people, by the way, were, were you know, were exploring all the transmedia content online for a good two weeks. And then they would be emailing me two weeks later. So I did a show in Montreal, for example, um, as part of Mutech Festival. And there were people from Montreal emailing me two weeks later to find out, is it really not true? Because they'd seen the website that told them it wasn't true. And um, yeah, it's kind of surprising. But, that, but I think that's, that, that was kind of the outcome at the end of it, was realizing that we believe what we want to believe. And it's hard to dissuade us if it's something that's exciting and, and it binds in with things that we want to feel are real in the world. It was amazing. And it was like, oh, it was really cool. Really strange, one of the weirdest experiences ever. It was amazing. It was really, um, kind of slightly overwhelming at the same time. It's like you're part of a, of a story. I like I was being visited by something that was quite sad and then. So, as a show, it, it was a, big experiment. It happened at a time when very few people were making virtual reality. It's still the case now that we don't really know how virtual reality is going to settle in terms of a storytelling medium. Um, but I felt at the time that it made sense for virtual reality to fit within this transmedia framework. So, you know, if you're really going to make a virtual reality, then it wouldn't just exist only in the headset, it would exist in a whole universe of content. So it would take over your whole life for a period of time. That was the idea with this show. And then what happened in, in 2018, when the show had kind of finished touring and I took everything down, um, I, I realized I couldn't really leave this story up because it would create, uh, you know, conspiracy theories that, that without me attending it, it would just be out of control and it would potentially become either really rubbish or just run out of control. So I took all the websites down and, um, and then I met, uh, I was working on a job in London and I met um, this woman, Myra Appiner, who had 
by chance, she had just finished creating a show that was on a similar scale called Somni. That show was in um, East London. It took over 20,000 square feet of um, empty warehouse space. It had loads of VR in it and had loads of performers. Um, and they'd use kinesthetic effects in the same way. And, um, and so we started talking about working together and then eventually we formed a company called Bright Black. And so we were thinking about who else can we get to come to see this show other than theatre audiences and we started marketing it to gamers and they came and they were very interesting audiences and that started a train of thought really which led me to then spend a lot of time reading about games design and once that started happening and the whole kind of concept of transmedia content so getting audiences to you know watch something in in a short space of time at a show but then give them content they can go and find online particularly with a story like this where they think it's real um, and so we have a lot of lessons to learn from video games and and I guess by the time whilst I was sleeping was coming to its end I was beginning to incorporate some of those lessons in but right now with the work that I'm making now with Bright Black we're thinking about um, video game design a lot in terms of how we make these immersive and interactive um, theatre and installation pieces. Simon Wilkerson, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much.